A 1998 journal article reported on findings from DNA associated with Thomas Jefferson and of Jefferson's slave, Sally Hemings. Findings validated, not proved, but validated, claims that Jefferson may have fathered some Hemings children. But scholarly responses stated why the same DNA would also fit links of lineage that would bypass Thomas Jefferson and instead lead to other men in his family. These other male Jefferson relatives were regularly at his Monticello plantation at times that Hemings became pregnant. If you wonder how a scholar can come to propagate just one of the claims and eschew the others, you are about to see a historian give an indication. And to my right, Catherine Kerrison, who uh, is a scholar of early American and gender history, uh, who was recent, recently became a full professor of history at Villanova University. And she's written Jefferson's Daughters, Three Sisters, White and Black, in a young America, the story of Jefferson's one black and two white daughters. Mm -hmm. We've been disputed this connection between Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. So as you worked on the book, did it change how you felt about Jefferson or changed how you felt about the founders? Um, I, didn't, I didn't see Jefferson differently so much um, uh, than I had before I started this project. I knew he was a slave owner. Um, but to, to actually kind of see him in this relationship um, and how he dealt with the children of his slave, Sally Hemings, um, was really quite revealing and, and that what I see ultimately is Jefferson is very human. Jefferson as in some ways very, very conventional. Um, and that ultimately, in seeing the humanity of our founders, I think that's actually kind of freeing and liberating, right? So we don't, we don't sort of feel as though we have to live up to these towering idols, uh, but, but in fact we can take sort of the best of what they have to, to offer, um, except that this is indeed part of the American story, and, and ask, okay, so what, what does that mean for us today? And that's what I tried to do. The professor's admission that she feels better believing Jefferson to be not as impressive as his best reputation invites comment. That subject will come after discussion about the specimens examined. What is the evidence that she or historians on the other side of the dispute have? DNA was not collected from Thomas Jefferson himself. No DNA was used from any direct descendant because the scientific test used requires an unbroken line of male descendants so as to test for markers on a Y chromosome passed from father to son. There is no such genetic line from Thomas Jefferson. Scientists were able to match the Y chromosome of one descendant of one Hemings child to the Y chromosome of descendants of Thomas Jefferson's uncle, meaning that the Y chromosome would have been passed to that uncle from Thomas Jefferson's grandfather who passed it also to Thomas Jefferson's father and yet another of the father's brothers. Thomas Jefferson's father passed it to the future president and to the president's brother, meaning that the chromosome also went into that brother's five sons who lived near Monticello. Thomas Jefferson's three sisters would not be carriers of the Y chromosome, so Jefferson's nephews, the Carr brothers, would not have it. There were yet many potential fathers among the male Jefferson relatives. Some nephews would pass along the Y chromosome, some would not. Some people assume that proof of paternity was established in the 1998 article by which the public first learned of the DNA evidence and think that all they have to do to argue that paternity was established is to point out that that article in a November 1998 issue of Nature was titled Jefferson Fathered Slave's Last Child. Those who do read the article find no statements which declare what the title had. The team of scientists and pathologists who were the researchers and authors of the article wrote a letter published in a subsequent issue of Nature in which they state that Jefferson's paternity was not established, and they refer to the article title having been assigned by the journal. The journal printed their statement and did not add any defense, even though editors sometimes do dispute the authors of letters in space underneath the letters they print. The pathologist who was the lead author also put on record his determination that paternity had not been proved in a letter he wrote published in the New York Times just days after the issue date of the Nature article. 
The New York Times had circulation many, many times that of nature, and its readership had great influence on what was repeated in the press elsewhere. A listener has grounds to wonder whether a speaker is concerned with the known facts when you hear something like... I think that's actually kind of freeing and liberating. Right, so we don't, we don't sort of feel as though we have to live up to these towering idols. A term that used to be part of popular culture was feet of clay, to express a desire that there not be people who set examples which less exacting people become blindingly uncomfortable with when they make comparisons to themselves. Objectivist intellectuals understand that underlying some such occurrences are philosophic skepticism, deference to social institutions in place of objectively perceived reality, and a succession of corruptions in Western culture traceable to Immanuel Kant. Now, if you want to see both Kantian elements, skepticism and the worship of the social, come together, consider the field of history today. Here is an excerpt from a course description at the University of Indiana in Bloomington. The course is titled Freedom and the Historian. Quote, History is made by the historian. Each generation of historians reinterprets the past in the light of its own historical experience and values. There can be thus no one definitive history of Alexander and no one historical truth about the fall of the Roman Empire. There have been as many concepts of history, as many views of historical truth as there have been cultures." Unquote. The skeptical theme here is clear. <clears throat> there is no one definitive history, no one historical truth. An old-fashioned person, even a skeptic, would react, well then, let's close down the field if we can't know the truth, but not the moderns. We can't know the real truth, they say, but we can know the subjective truth that we ourselves create. History is made by the historian. If there's a consensus of historians, therefore, their viewpoint is valid and worth studying for that time and culture. As in Kant, there are two realities the real past, which is unknowable, and the private world each generation creates, its own subjective historical truth. Notice that in this viewpoint, the historian is at once helpless and omnipotent. He can know nothing really, but on the other hand, he's the creator of history, <clears throat> of the history that we can know, and so he is an unchallengeable authority. If any student disagrees with the fraternity of historians, therefore he has no chance. On the one side, he hears, who are you to know? There are no definitive facts. On the other, he hears, history is made by the historian. Who are you to question? Observe, by the way, what people allow themselves when hiding behind a group. If the author of that course description were to say, history is made by me, he would be dismissed as a paranoid personality. But when he says it collectively, history is made by us, by our guild, by historians, that's acceptable. This is the exaltation of the social generated by Kant. In the objectivist approach to reasoning, and thus to scholarship in all its forms, there are definitive facts. A human being using an objective approach can know what is true. And people from differing backgrounds can use rational methods to discover truth and share and accept single unifying explanations about what those true facts mean. Any rational person knowing that he's not guilty of a murder would want police to keep investigating if the police discovered that DNA evidence left on a victim merely has some aspects of one's own DNA. Likewise, a rational person concerned with the direction of his culture should want university faculty to take a proper facts-oriented approach when investigating the artifacts of history. Pleas were advanced just after the DNA findings that Jefferson's reputation should be reframed as having fathered slaves' children because the reframing, it was said, would be good for race relations now. Never mind that race relations have improved markedly in the two centuries since Jefferson's time. What gets lost in the reframing machinations is that the best way for individuals and groups of every kind to get along well is to be united on looking at facts as the basis of conclusions. A reasoned understanding of the facts had not been what was most frequently used to establish Jefferson's culpability since 1998. An understanding based on reason is far from what comes from the modern historians who are so eager for there to be a prominent villain or hero that they, in effect, draft Thomas Jefferson to be bogeyman or trendsetter. 
This occurs even when such historians seek only to please a particular historian's limited audience. Dr. Peikoff addresses this point in a passage that follows immediately from the excerpt just heard from him. And there is a further development of the Kantian approach here. <clears throat> Why, historians soon began to ask, should the social authority be universal? Why can't there be many groups of historians, each creating history in accordance with its own mental structure, each version, version being true for that group, though not for the others? Why, in effect, shouldn't we be democratic and let every collective into the act? The result of this line of thinking is pressure group history, a kind of pluralization of the Kantian approach in which each group rewrites the past according to its own predilections, and every group's views are deemed to be as valid or invalid as every other group's. To be progressive in history today means precisely this. It means to respect the rewriting of all the newest groups, especially if it makes no sense to you because that shows that you are open-minded and are not trying to impose your group's private views on other groups. To each his own subjectivism, in effect. 